And you're getting into acting now? Ah, yes. Let's, let's talk about your acting career. Okay, since you asked. Finger! <laughs> Perfect. And that woman named Asha Queen sounded absolutely right. <laughs> uh, Mad Max is out. I got to ask you about that briefly. What a hoot. <laughs> Actually, I'm wearing one of the costumes that I was photographed from Mad Max. No, no not this one. But um, it's a very exciting movie. I'm very excited about it. And um, I think it can really set me up for acting. I think so, too. Hi, everybody, and welcome back. My name is Ben. And today, we're going to have a look at Tina's very short but interesting movie career. Let's go. To most people, Tina Turner is seen as a bigger-than-life singer with an unparalleled career. But despite her massive success and what one could perceive as an incredible achievement, she often stated that what really attracted her was acting. Has it been a, an idea of yours for all your life to be in movies? Or My just, dream. Really? Why? Why, why, why films? Because, I mean, people know you as, as the singer. Why films all of a sudden? Because I've been singing all my life, even when I was a little girl and all through church and all of that. And that's not a mystery. That's not a challenge. You just give me a song and I can sing and I can always dance. Acting is something I've never done. And when I was a little girl, I'd go to, to movies and come home and act a part out for my, for my mother and my grandmother. Between four and five, she started going to movies, you know, to show with, uh, with Aline and uh, first cousin Clara Mae Bullock. And when she come home, she would act the part. She would sing part of the songs. One day she fell out in the floor during an act and held her breath, and I thought she was going to die. <laughs> I had to make her get up out of the floor. She said, well, that's what the that lady did in the movie. And I, it's just what I wanted to do. Uh, it was like my dream. Like most people say, I want to sing, and I, want, I wanted to act. I wanted to be an actress. But. Not acting just for the sake of being on a big screen, no. Acting to play a strong character to entertain audience in action adventure movies. Tina wants to be Grace Jones in Conan the Destroyer, Singune Weaver in Alien, someone as charismatic as she is. I can say I like the part of the, that the girls played, but uh, I would have been preferred to be with the Russians. I like to be on the, on oh, the yes. bad side. <laughs> you always like to be on the bad I side. I like to yeah. be on the bad side. <laughs> Many of us came but not one that would fit Tina's own vision of a movie star. Who can say no to Spielberg? Tina did. Oh, she is Tina Turner who turned down the color purple. Well, you make it sound a little bit No, I'm just asking. I didn't unkind. make it sound anyway. Yes, you did. Okay. Really? I apologize. OK. I apologize. I thought you would give me a hard time. No, I'm, I'm, uh, you t it said here you turned down the color purple. OK. I denied Color Purple because it was too close to my personal life. It, I had just left such a life, and it was too soon to be reminded of. I, for acting for me, I need something else. I don't need to do what I've just stepped out of. It was very wrong. I was very excited, very flattered that I was asked, Mr. Spielberg, but it was just a wrong movie for me at so that no time. So no regrets over not doing no, it, even though... No, The first footage of Tina on a movie screen goes back to 1970 and her incendiary performance of Audis Redding, I've Been Loving You Too Long, in the Rolling Stones' Gimme Shelter. Gimme Shelter is an incredible movie documenting the Stones' 1969 tour with much focus on the tragic concert at Altamont. <laughs> A performance Tina doesn't like to be reminded of. Ah, stop it! Alright, kill it. <laughs> so I'm not gonna dwell on it, but I absolutely love it. I discovered this while I was in my early teens as a green Tina fan, so to speak. And she was so young, she was so hot. It's pure sex and blues, and the performance is as much iconic as the documentary and Tina herself. This performance of I've Been Loving You Too Long has become a memorable moment of pop culture. Not a bad start for a movie career. The following year, in 1971, Ike and Tina would be once again captured performing live, but this time for a real feature film and for the cameras of Czech filmmakers Milos Forman. <laughs> Entitled Taking Off, the movie would only give a singing part for Tina, 
with the performance of Goodbye So Long. Taking Off was released on Blu-ray a few years ago, and as you can see, the restoration work speaks for itself. The year is 1975 and Tina is getting closer to a real role. Still with a song, but this time a song especially written for the movie slash album, Tommy. I had all these fantasy ideas, you know, when you become a star, you think you have a star on the door and when you go on stage, the fans will blow. It was nothing like that. Chen comes in with this big baggy shirt on, his old pants, hair all over his face. I would go, oh God, is this a director, you know? This isn't what the, the thing sounds like, you know? So Ken, we, we sat and we talked, but I had, I, I, I sort of liked him from the very beginning. There was, well, he always reminds me of like Santa Claus, the way Santa Claus looked, you know. So when, the first day there, we started going through the wig bit, what's, what, which wig he wanted me to wear, a very long wig or a sort of very short one that moved. So he selected a very long one. Then he said um, uh, about the short dress. Well, I didn't get a picture of how I was supposed to have looked. A mini skirt and mini skirts are not in anymore. I didn't know what was actually going on, right? So then he said, um, well, we, the, the girl went out and got a little short skirt, and so I sort of laughed it off. I said, okay. So I was teasing him. I said, I have some uh, um, uh, textured holes, black with a few runs. He said, with a few runs? Great. I said, what do you know about runs? David Bowie was first choice, but a few years before contributing to Tina's comeback, he could also be thanked for giving her her first big screen debut in The Who's Tommy. Featuring a crazy cast, with of course The Who, Anne Margaret, that Tina absolutely adores. Where are you? You're right there, surprise! <laughs> Elton John, that Tina absolutely. You don't tell me how to play my piano. Oh Lord. And another hero of mine, Mr. Jack Nicholson. How do you write women so well? I think of a man, and I take away reason and accountability. The character plot of the Acid Queen is pretty obvious, although. I didn't take the part. Actually, I didn't actually know that I was an acid queen, right. drug queen. I took the part because she was a mad woman and she, she turned into that machine and she had that little apartment up there and, and I was excited about that. And as I was doing the part, I, didn't, I still didn't really realize what was happening because I didn't read the script, I only read just mm -hmm. that part. And when the girls brought the pillow with the needle, I went, oh, I'm promoting <laughs> drugs, I couldn't believe it. I was, wasn't too happy about that, so we took a, just a second for me to sort of compose myself and I realized, well, it is acting after all, you know, and uh, people know that I never really did drugs. So that was a part of what that was like. But other than that, it was so exciting. Mm -hmm. The part of the Acid Queen gave a new audience to Tina and Tommy is regarded today as a cult movie by an entire generation. Those who've seen the movie at a young age, like me, still probably remember the very strong effects it procures. I sure do. The song Acid Queen will become a classic song for Tina and the album of the same name is probably the most rock and roll and underrated album of Tina's career. In 1978, while struggling to get her career back into the spotlight, Tina appeared briefly in the movie Sgt. Pepper Lonely Hearts Club, a movie with the Bee Gees inspired from the album of the same name by the Beatles. The Beatles were not involved in the project and the movie was a flop. 1985 and Tina is in the middle of the biggest comeback in music history thanks to an Australian manager. But thanks to an Australian director, Tina will be given the chance of a lifetime. Max, uh, you know, is about a post-apocalyptic world and we needed someone who was very powerful but most of all was a wonderful survivor. That no matter what happened in, uh, after the apocalypse, that this is someone who had, had endured and become very strong and had tremendous inner resources. And we're writing this character, uh, the Queen of Barter Town. And um, as a writing reference, we kept on saying, you know, someone like Tina Turner, someone like Lee Tina Turner. And when it came to shooting the film, we said, well, let's ask 
Tina Turner if she if she really wants to do it. And uh, luckily she was available. She had a gap in her concerts at that stage and was able to do it. And Roger comes in, he goes, this is incredible. He said, George Miller just rang. He's interested in you doing Mac Mac. Oh, God, that was it. Oh, I was definitely a warrior woman. I mean, everything was going click, 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 click. A lot of stuff happened after. The movie was shot in the scorching heat of the Australian desert. People passed out on the set. However, Tina enjoyed every single second of it. She has often referred to this experience as one of the most enjoyable moments of her career. Once the story was finished, casting began. And I'm pleased to say that Tina Turner was asked to play the role of a queen, queen of body town. But what I didn't know was that my costume was made of all chain mail, weighing over 70 pounds. <laughs> it's like a dream that I had years ago of what movies were like. I mean, all of the vans here and the people in their hats and the cameras. and the... Now, this is show business to me, more so than singing. That's what the excitement is. And when those cars drive into a little town like Kuvipedi is like this would come into Nutwich. It's like, no! What I received from Mel was the chance to observe him as an actor and learn from it. To actually see him transform Mel Gibson into Matt Max, it was really quite amazing. I, I tease him all the time about all of his little quirks and bounces, and, and then all of a sudden he just pulls right in when it's time for that camera. I could beckon to one of the guards to bring him to me. Yeah. Bring him closer yeah. yeah. Would you come forward if she beckoned you? Just try. Yeah. All right. See how it plays. Yeah. See how it plays. Try it again. And what did you do before all this? I was a cop, a driver. But how the world turned. One day cock of the wall, next to feather dust. I thought acting as a singer would be very much as um, doing lines or becoming a character, but I find the difference is if Tina Turner sings a song, she makes it as much as Tina Turner. But Tina Turner has nothing to do with entity. My personality and my, my performance has nothing to do with the woman and the part that I'm playing now. That's never a part of my show performance that I am doing as an actress. I find it's a total difference when it really comes to the work. The movie was filmed in the late 84, early 85, in the middle of the Australian summer. And Tina got to celebrate her 45th birthday with the movie crew who threw her a surprise birthday party. Here we go, one each. She's only going to blow a candle each out. <laughs> This weekend. This weekend. Let's go. Now you have to sing it. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Okay, as you know, I'm leaving. Uh, and I really have to say that it's been on the desert, but this has been the most exciting time, I think, in my entire life. This is really better than a hit record. And also, I got to say that I really had great vibes from everybody. It's really a great group of people. I'm really, really happy to be able to do my first movie with everybody that I really and truly like and care about. And I want to thank you for helping to make it really comfortable and a wonderful time. I believe in God, yes. Not as man, as power well, there we go. and the forces. I'm very universal when it comes to that law. I think the power comes from the power of the universe out there. It's unknown. You have to find it. You have to find the connection. And uh, what that connection is, is us. We are a little universe here. It's all inside of us. And how we manifest that nature in ourselves to bring out 
the God that we are. Sometimes it's very difficult to people to, for people to understand that because they want to make it someone else to give the answers and was all inside. Yes, I believe in God. And of course, you cannot mention Mad Max without this. We don't need Written by Terry Britton, We Don't Need Another Hero would become yet another global hit for Tina, reaching number two in the USA and number three in the UK, but failing to win the Grammy for Best Pop Vocal Performance. The B-side of We Don't Need Another Hero, the opening track of the movie, is the incredible punk rock song One of the Living, written by Holy Knight. It wouldn't gain the massive success of Hero, but Tina would win a Grammy for best rock vocal performance. And for the small story, the one of the living clip was shot in a former prison, the East Riverside Penitentiary in Philadelphia, and it's possible to visit it. Going back to the movie and watching all the interviews of Tina, you can really feel that this is the new direction that she wants to take, and it's really looking forward to more of those. Then came Mad Max, mm. Beyond the Thunderdome. Yeah. How was it? Another queen, huh? You see? You see? I have, I have reasons to ask you about the... Well, I don't know why. People seem to want to get into that title. Maybe it's because I've worked a long time. That was the epitome of my acting career at this point because I was actually speaking. You see, with that's a queen, I was still dancing and singing. Entity didn't dance or she didn't sing. She was driving cars and she mm. was queen of a city and she was in control of something she had built. And I felt really very strong playing the part of that mm -hmm. woman. Mm -hmm. I mean, it actually sort of felt like something I'd done maybe another lifetime or something. And, and I was there alone. It was the first time that I'd totally gone on my own. No management, no assistance, nothing. Just me with the movie people. And I really do know that that's what I want to do. I know that's the next step. Mm -hmm. The 90s would be a decade of soundtrack for Tina. First, with the release of the movie and album What's Love Got To Do With It in 1993, Tina re-recorded old songs and a few new ones for the biopic soundtrack. But the whole thing is a video all of itself. Still, while visiting the set of her own biopic, Tina ended doing a cameo appearance in Last Action Hero with Arnold Schwarzenegger that was being filmed in the lot next to What's Love. Now you go in there and it's your bad! Jack, I know it's made of this great metropolis. You and I have had our little tits, but this is the Lieutenant Governor. Slater, here's what I oh. When the Governor gets here, call me. Slater's attempted to enter. Do not let him in. Repeat, do not let him in. Piece of cake. Hey, you want to be a farmer? Here's a couple of acres. Fast forward to 1995, and Tina added another feather in her cap with... Golden Eye. When I received Golden Eye, this is a bond. Yeah. I thought, he, he didn't make a proper demo. He just, someone just uh, threw the music together and he, he, was, he had just written the song. And when Roger, my manager, said, Tina, this is a song, this is a, he told me, it's, it, was, it was a big break. So he said, uh, it's, it's a little bit rough. And I, I thought, what, well, I, how, how do I put this together? Even it wasn't showing me what the melody was. And so, I, yeah, I would have to say I created as close to what I thought the melody was of that. It was your melody, not Bono's. It was my melody. Close enough that he gave me a guideline, but not enough to sing, just to sing it. I had to, I had to work really hard. And I remember I really closed myself off when I, just, I had just moved here when that happened to really find... Golden eye, no time. That part was clear, but right. the verses, there was no guide. <laughs> he said, and I remember when he said, I should have known. Uh, he said, I don't know what he should have known, except he should have written the song, actually. <laughs> but it was, he was very pleased with the outcome of it. Yeah, he was in the studio when the song was uh, being recorded. And yeah, that was another, that was another feat. That was, that was hard. But I was, I was proud of myself when I came up with a song out of what he sent me. Yeah. I, I, I don't think he really meant for me to sing it. I don't think he really meant that anything could come from that. I don't even really think he cared to write a song for Bond with what he gave me. I wish I still had some of that stuff, but 
Yeah, I, I, was, I knew then that I had talent to sing anything put before me. You could make it live. I could make it live. The song was a major hit, mostly in European countries, and the title often tops the band's soundtrack top 10 songs, among the great band hits like Goldfinger or Skyfall. This new hit would lead Tina back to the studio for the recording of the Wildest Dreams album and its subsequent world tour. Tina was invited to the London premiere of the movie and, well... And of course, who's his premiere says, interview. Tina, how did you feel about being offered the title song in a Bond movie? Oh, I was extremely excited. And even more so after <clears throat> the final song came along and it was um, Bono and Edge. And everything just started looking like a picture's coming here. This is beginning to feel really good. So, so when they first asked you, you didn't know who, whose song or what song it was going to be? No, because there were many songwriters. We received about 10 songs, actually, for me to listen to and approve, actually. So, because if the song hadn't been right, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have taken it. And was the, the, the one written by Bono and the Edge, I mean, the Golden Eye theme song, was that your outright favorite, or were you no, torn a little bit? No, that was it, because it sounded, it sounded right. It sounded like say a theme for a movie i mean some of the songs were just a good song but it wasn't it wasn't appropriate for a movie i thought you know and i just didn't want to take it otherwise and and were you a u2 fan before oh, of course <laughs> i know the guys we were actually neighbors in the south of france and who says british premiere says who else but tina turner who supplies the title song She was very excited to be working with the U2 boys who actually wrote the theme song. <coughs> and of course, 007 himself, Pierce Brosnan. We are part of each other. In the late 90s, early 2000, two collaborations with the Disney company would bring Tina to a new audience. First in 98, with The Lion King 2, Simba's Pride, a pretty unfortunate sequel that went straight to VHS. And it was even more unfortunate that Tina was not cast for the first Lion King. But still, the song she gave us is just, to me, a masterpiece. I love it, Disney fans love it, I play it often, Tina did an incredible work on it. What are we the bigger for? project for Tina in Disney, uh, since performing in front of Donald for the opening of Disneyland Paris in April 92. <laughs> was Brother Bear. Thanks to a bit of a push from Michael Eisner, it landed Tina a new collaboration with Phil Collins. I think it was Michael Eisner who felt very strongly to have a, a woman sing the opening track. Tina Turner just seemed like the right call, so we sent the tapes over and Phil and Chris and Tina Turner sat down together and recorded it. I was very excited about it. The song is great, music's wonderful, and ah, it's just a great feeling. And then as I listen more and more, I start to really feel, oh, this is a good song that I can sing. This is a song I want to sing. And I was pleased to, that I was working with Bill, so I was really thrilled. And Tina, of course, being the kind of singer, rhythm and blues singer she is, you know, I mean, she, she just et it up, so it was, I didn't have any problems with the, with the performance side. Tina would make sensation, making a rare appearance at the premiere of the movie and even performing there.
2005 and it is getting super exciting. Tina is supposed to appear in the new Ismail Merchant movie entitled The Goddess. <laughs> Ismail Merchant and James Ivory are known for their very distinguished film d'époque, such as Howard Hands and Wuthering Heights, casting most of the time classical British actors. But this time, Tina is wanted. More than wanted, she's desired. And for what? A goddess, portraying goddess Kali. The legend took a trip to India with the director to emerge herself into the role. Another queen, an Indian one, songs in Latin and Sanskrit, everything seems to be perfect for Tina. An exciting project and a close link to her spiritual side and beliefs in reincarnation. Unfortunately, the project never saw the light of day after the sudden death of Ismail Merchant. Other missed opportunities for Tina includes a biopic of Bessie Smith that was supposed to be directed by Vincente Minnelli, husband of and father of. It's not cause I wouldn't, it's not cause I shouldn't. German actress Marlene Dietrich also wanted Tina to play her if a movie of her life was ever made, claiming that Tina was the only one to have the balls to do it. He's stuck, that's what it is. He's and more famously, Tina was considered for the part of Whoopi Goldberg in Ghost. Thank you so, so much for watching. Stay safe and I leave you with Tina's words. I'm a, I'm a single woman basically and, and I know that I have to work. So I would also love to act. And um, Tommy and Mad Max just sort of let me know that I can do it with proper direction. So after Break Every Rule tour, I went to Hollywood and I let the top people know that I was really ready to act. What I ran into is there are very few parts for women, especially blacks. And so I'm, I, I think I'm a person that I have to wait for period movies. It has to be something like what George Miller came up with or what Conan was doing in the early stages or I have to wait for those parts. Um, we'll see, but I still think that it's there. That's another person there that wants to come out 